From artisanal Gouda cheese to prestigious Aberon ham, sardines canned with a century old method to giant Amalfi lemons turned into limoncello, food is unique to specific regions and countries. We traveled around the world to show you how some of these traditional foods are made. Our first stop is a family farm in the Netherlands, home to some of the rarest wheels of Gouda cheese. Every year, 650 million kilos of Gouda cheese are produced in the Netherlands. Most of it is produced industrially, using pasteurized milk. But there are some exceptions. We're here to visit one of the few farms that is still producing traditional raw milk Gouda cheese. We make a real farming cheese on this farm. And we are specialized in old, in aged cheese. And the taste will really be special when it's aged. This place is actually quite remote. We're like immersed in nature and we're actually on an island. We had to take a small boat and uh, cross the canal in order to get here. Do I go back? We're in the right direction, maybe? Not very coordinated, no? How do you row? And uh, the woman that is producing the cheese is actually doing it in her own house, which is this one behind me. Depending on whether you're a native, you will pronounce it either Gouda or Gouda. So since we're talking about authentic Dutch cheese, we're going to call it Gouda. The cheese takes its name from the city of Gouda in South Holland. But unlike with other cheeses that are named after cities, there was never any cheese making in Gouda. In the Middle Ages, Gouda acquired sole cheese market rights, basically becoming the only city in the country where farmers could trade their cheese. Gouda was associated so much with the cheese sold there that it was eventually named after the city. The Gouda cheese market was started in 1395. Today, it is one of the most popular attractions in the Netherlands. There are only 280 farmers across the country still making raw milk borenkas or farmer's cheese. And there are only two farms that take their cheese to the next level, making Burengauze Opperklasse, or aged artisanal Gouda, a special type of raw milk farmhouse cheese that must weigh at least 20 kilograms and can be made only in the summer with cattle grazing in the Greenheart region, between the cities of Amsterdam, Rotterdam and Utrecht. Meet Mariah van der Poel who lives on an island in the village of Rijkwettering in South Holland with her husband Hugo and their three children and makes 15 wheels of aged artisanal Gouda every day at the back of their house. The family van der Poel started here in 1932. So my husband's uh, grandfather, grandmother, they started here and we still make cheese on the same way, on the authentic way of cheese making. And in 1965, uh, his father and mother they came here, they married and they came and start also and they make cheese. We start living here in 1996 uh, we get married and uh, uh, my mother-in-law, she make, she learned me how to make cheese. And now, uh, so I do it now for 23 years on my own. We have 150 cows and we milk them twice a day. The cheese is made from cold milk from the previous day and warm milk that's fresh. Every morning I wake up at 10 to 6 and my husband uh, wake up uh, at 4.15. He calls the cows out of the land and they come and then at 5 o'clock he starts milking them. And in the evening before he also milks the cows. And then when I wake up at 10 to 6, the first thing I do I make the milk sour. And then at 7 o'clock I have about uh, 3,000, a bit more milk, liters. And then I put some rennet to, to it. And when you put some rennet to it, the milk will get thick in 30 minutes. It's real special every morning. So when I leave the milk rest for 30 minutes, after that short time, you can cut it really slowly. And when you cut it, the fresh cheese will go down and the whey will go up. We bring the whey away. We uh, spread it all over our land. And the real fresh cheese, we keep stirling, stirling, 
and slowly we bring it back to the temperature of the cows, up to 37 degrees, not higher, because we make raw milk cheese. The process of adding warm water to the cheese, called washing the curd, is generally used to make the cheese sweeter. Washing the curd removes lactose, which bacteria could transform into acid. Blocks of curd are then pressed together into wooden molds with the help of linen clothes. We still use the molds of my husband's grandfather and grandmother. The wooden molds is real special to make cheese. There are only a few cheesemakers in Holland who still use wooden molds. It's uh, because we think uh, the wooden molds is the best to make old aged cheese because the wooden molds keep the warm inside and that's the best that the, the, for the taste. So the taste after two years is really special. You can still make slices of it after two years and that's real special. There are only two farmers in Holland who make this cheese. So that's really, really special. Each wheel has a unique plaque made from milk protein with information about where and when it was produced. The curds are pressed in the wooden molds for two hours on each side. In the evening, they are moved to brines. It's a natural way to bring salt into the wheels and water, slowly, only a few, out of the wheels. And that's different of the factories, because in the factories where they make cheese, they bring salt uh, during the making process. And we do it on an authentic way, in a salty bath. So really slowly. Cheese wheels stay five days in the salty baths, then dry for 24 hours. The Van der Poel family keeps them for a week in their farm, where they are covered by a biological coating. We put the coating on it three times every site because it's easier to keep them clean. And then every week a trader is collecting about 90 wheels up here and he keeps them in big trader houses, warehouses I think, warehouses for a long time. And he ages them because we are good in making cheese and he's good in aging cheese. Gouda has to age for at least 28 days. This specialty, the aged artisanal Hauda, ages for at least two years, but some wheels can age longer. And there are no farmers who take the risk to, ke to keep the cheese as long as we do in warehouses. So it's really special. Perfect. It looks perfect. Only a few small holes, so the cheese looked at you like eyes. Only a few. And you see the crystals. All the people think they are salty crystals, but it's protein crystals. Mariah has cut us a slice of a three-year-old cheese and uh, as you can see from the texture it's actually quite soft and uh, it's something that I wasn't expecting coming from a cheese that has been aged for three years like three years is such a long time and I would expect it to be like harder but here it is let's give it a try it's got like real real milk milky cheesy taste like no no salt at all and it's sort of like nutty caramel like like it reminds me a bit of parmesan in a way but in the sense that like it kind of touches the same taste buds but texture wise is completely different like this one is softer and um, it melts more in your mouth it's uh, it's buttery Authentic Dutch Hauda is protected by the EU's Protected Geographical Indication under the name Hauda Holland. This certifies that the cheese comes from Holland and has been made traditionally with Dutch milk. Just like Mariah and her family, Conserva Spinhaeche in Matusinhos, Portugal, is keeping a 100-year-old sardine canning tradition alive.
from uh, Portugal. We are in uh, Matosinhos, a town uh, nearby Porto. We are at uh, Conservas Pinhais, which is uh, one of the oldest uh, preserving factories here in Portugal and one of the few that still uh, can sardines the traditional artisanal way. Today we're going to learn how this small fish got such a big cult following. We're going to see how sardines are canned here at Pinhais and taste a few to understand what sets this artisanal method apart. If you travel to Portugal, chances are you will come back home with an array of souvenirs in the shape of sardines. And during the country's festivities in June, 13 sardines are eaten every second. The country has a long fish canning tradition, to the point that the sardine has become a national icon. But why? In Portugal, we have a coast that is Mediterranean, which is very grand, in which the most important, most famous, and most quality, with most sabor, is sardine. E, portanto, aí deu origem ao aparecimento da indústria conserveira. Canning itself did not originate in Portugal. It was a French confectioner, Nicolas Aper, who first successfully preserved foods with the method. He found his way to fame in the early 1800s after presenting his inventions to French Emperor Napoleon, who was looking for a new food preserving method to feed his army. After Aper's discovery was made public, canning quickly became popular. With Portugal's extensive coastline and an abundance of fish, it wasn't hard for the country to jump on the trend, and by 1925, it counted about 400 canneries. Agora, quando foi a Segunda Guerra, os alemães e os ingleses aí exportou-se muita coisa, porque eles também pagavam. Com a guerra, houve um desenvolvimento da indústria conserveira muito grande. An important fish import already, Matosinhos became a hub for the canning industry. Em Matosinho, uns anos atrás, havia 50 fábricas de sardinha. Empregavam à volta 6 mil funcionários. Portanto, era uma zona industrial. Aqui o porto de pesca de Matosinhos tinha 200 barcos que buscavam sardinha. Atualmente tem 20 barcos. Existem atualmente duas fábricas de conserva em Matosinhos. Portanto, está a ver que a zona industrial passou a ser uma zona habitacional de Matosinhos. Portanto, a indústria. After the war, the industry gradually declined. In 2013, Portugal counted only 20 fish preserving factories. Many factors contributed to this decline. The replacement of high quality ingredients with cheaper raw material, climate change, fishing regulations due to diminishing stock, and the automation of the canning process. Founded in 1920, Pinhais is one of Portugal's last surviving preserving factories. My father, my father, my father also worked here. They founded this house. All the traditional process of artisanal. The workers started to become a family. We have a generation of people here, with the parents, the mothers, the daughters. So, it's a complete family. Here, for example, in the factory of Pinhais, Mantemos o processo desde, a, desde 1920. Aqui trabalham 103, 80 mulheres e 23 homens. Nós temos uma capacidade produtiva diária, à volta de 300 caixas mais ou menos. Fazemos 30 mil latas por dia. Se comparar a uma indústria, uma fábrica industrializada, faz mil caixas por dia, 100 mil latas por dia. Agora, em termos de qualidade, não tem comparação possível. Pinhais makes four types of canned sardines. Sardines in olive oil, sardines in tomato sauce, spiced sardines in olive oil, and sardines in spiced tomato sauce. We follow the making of, of sardines in tomato sauce and the spiced sardines in olive oil. These are the fresh sardines that have arrived this morning from uh, Matuzinho's Harbour, and uh, the canning process will take place in one day. So everything is going to be uh, finished by 5 p.m. this afternoon. All the sardines are going to be tinned. Now it's time to go and see how uh, sardines are actually canned here at Pinhais. After the sardines arrive at the factory, they are placed on a marble table and the head and the bowl of the fish are cut off by hand. Then they are brined for about half an hour. The 
The sardines are placed on grids that are handmade by Senor Albino in his workshop at the factory. Then the sardines are rinsed to remove salt and steamed. Portanto, todas essas etapas, e um dos segredos está nisso é que, repare, se a sardinha, como, como as firmas faziam, a maior parte delas coziam a sardinha dentro da lata, quer dizer que a gordura e a umidade da sardinha fica na lata. E se a sardinha for cozida em grelhas, ao arrefecer, escorre essa gordura e essa umidade. Portanto, ao ser enlatada na fase posterior, a qualidade é muito melhor. All the ingredients are cut during the day and handed by hand, one by one. Each can of spiced sardines has one pitch of black pepper, carrot, laurel, piri piri, clove and cucumber. Signora Emilia is in charge of the tomato sauce and she keeps her recipe secret. The fish are canned in tin plate tins, then washed and sterilized. These are the only two machines at the factory. These two ladies are in charge of quality control. They do that by listening carefully to the sound of each tin. This is the sound of a good tin, and this is a bad one. Tins are stored for at least three to six months. Whenever a customer submits an order, the cans are wrapped by hand, which, by the way, is not an easy job, as I had the chance to wrap a can myself. This one, okay. We have more than one there. Okay. First for the bottom. So we have finished our tour here at uh, Pignage and uh, now it's time for tasting. We have sardines in tomato sauce and uh, sardines in uh, spiced olive oil. This is actually my very, very, very first time eating sardines out of a can. Now it's uh, sardines in tomato sauce time. I'm not good at opening cans. This particular can was made in 2015. It's four years ago. Well, let's have a sardine. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> wow. Wow, this is so good. It's really amazing. It tastes as sweet as tomatoes and uh, the oil is, is incredible. Like just by this one bite, I can tell that it's good oil. I have a bad memory of canned stuff because I'm really scared of like the strong taste of vinegar or uh, like very, very bad vegetable oil. Whereas this is so fresh, it's so nice. It reminds me of just like my grandmother cooking tomato sauce. She could have just, you know, done it this morning and this would be my lunch, like so good. Oh. <laughs> Okay, well, let's try the spiced. I'm not a big fan of spices, so <laughs> let's see if this is going to change my mind. It's not the spice that I was expecting. This one is a very subtle spice, and also it tastes very like earthy. I can taste the laurel straight away, and that is interesting because that's like a very, very, very tiny part. Why haven't, haven't I been eating sardines all this time? <laughs> like, so good. Canning them, I think, makes them even better. Pinaish exports 90% of its products all over the globe, from Austria to the Caribbean. We nós apostamos sempre nos mesmos fornecedores, no mesmo processo, no mesmo método e na mesma qualidade de produto. E acho que isso foi a aposta ganha o processo de trabalho, a maneira como elas trabalham, o ambiente trabalha, o riso que elas têm na cara, a maneira como fazem. Não há máquina melhor do que isso, dessa equipa. 
We leave the Portuguese coast and move inland to the majestic Douro Valley, where port wine is stomped by foot at the rhythm of music. Hello from the Douro Valley in Portugal, where we're going to find out how port wine is made. Today we're going to visit Taylor's, which is uh, one of the top wine houses here in uh, Portugal producing uh, port wine. Port is a very special wine, not only because, unlike all the wines, it's very sweet, but also because it retains a lot of the, of the human element. For example, we are going to see how traditional food trading is done, which is a very important and traditional part of uh, the making of port wine, and is very much done by hand, or we should say, by foot. So why is this method still being used? And how did this contribute to making port one of the most popular wines in the world? Port wine is a fortified wine, and what differentiates port from a, a normal wine is that we will take the grapes, and if you were to make a red wine from these grapes, you would let all of your sugar be transformed into alcohol, and the final alcohol of the wine is the result of the initial sugar in your grape. In a port wine, we will take the same grapes, start fermenting, and when half of the sugar has been converted to alcohol, we will run off the juice and we will add a neutral grape spirit, which will kill the yeast, so the sweetness in the, uh, the glass of port is the natural sugar from the grape, and the wine alcohol, the spirit that we use, is there to raise your port to an alcohol level of 20% where it is stable and has the ability to age. And that's what differentiates port as a, as a wine style to other wines. Although port wine bears the name of the seaport city of Porto, it is actually in the steep hillsides of the Douro Valley in northern Portugal that it has been made for centuries. The region was legally demarcated by the Portuguese government in 1756 meaning that authentic port can only be made here. The Douro Valley is characterized for being a region of mountain viticulture in hot climate. The summer temperatures are very high. We get up to the 40 degrees centigrade on a regular basis, and our winters are cold. We have low rainfall, so it's very arid. And it is exactly these conditions that uh, leads to the vineyards and the grapes we produce, producing naturally high sugar levels and a lot of concentration of colour. Most of them are local indigenous grape varieties, names like Tariga Francesa, Tinta Rorige, Tinto Cão. These are varieties which are naturally very drought resistant and uh, uh, resist to these very, very tough conditions. Wines from the Douro Valley used to be transported in barrels on boats through the Douro River all the way to Porto where they would eventually sail to the rest of Europe, in particular to England, which Portugal has held strong trading links with since the 14th century. Really, the, the big break, if you like, for port happened where, because Britain, which was the main importing market, um, had, through various conflicts with, uh, with uh, intercontinental Europe, particularly with France, uh, found that it was putting high taxes on French wine. So wines from Portugal um, were being exported to the UK, they became very popular. And then of course, as, as the UK itself became um, a, a nation that was expanding out across the world with its empire, it took the habit of, of drinking port with it to, to many corners of the world. Taylor's is one of the founding port houses, established in 1692. It owns 500 hectares of vineyards in the Douro Valley. We visited Quinta de Vagelos, one of the company's most prestigious estates and home to some of its finest sports. Every September, a group of grape pickers from the villages of the Douro Valley is recruited to do the harvest. They are paid, fed and get accommodation at the Quinta. The pickers start working at 8 a.m. in the vines, where they pick grapes by hand. At sunset, they move indoors to press the grapes by foot. In these, what we call a lagar, which is a granite fermenter, this is where we do the traditional method of foot treading to produce our port. One of the beauties of foot treading and using this very simple process is that your foot 
is doing an intense action of taking the color out of the skins, but at the same time, it's very soft. So you extract what's good and you leave behind what is more aggressive. And that is so difficult to replicate in any mechanical means. And that's why we continue to use it. Up, up, the traders move in unison and in silence, except for the marcador, who marks the time. After two hours, the Cansar da Libertad, or Song of Freedom, marks the beginning of the second stage. Riders now move freely to the sound of music, which goes on for another few hours. Less labor-intensive fermentation techniques have been invented, like these fermentation tanks that replicate the action of food treading. But to make the finest ports, like vintages, the traditional method is still preferred. After treading, the wine stays in the lagarish for two or three days to ferment. Wooden plungers are used to keep the grape skins in constant contact with the extracted juice. When half of the natural sugar of the grape has fermented and turned into alcohol, the juice is drawn out and fortified with a neutral grape spirit, which raises the alcohol level to 20%. At this stage, the winemakers don't know yet which style of port the wine is going to be. It will be decided in January, after the wine has rested for six months in wooden vats. The winemakers will then taste it and, depending on the chosen style, the wine will age differently in the company's cellars in Porto. One of the most exciting things about port is that from the same vineyards, you can actually produce incredibly different styles. So if you age it in large wooden fats, fats with 20, 30, 40,000 liters, you have this large volume of liquid, very little surface area of wood, and you retain all this big, um, fresch berry fruit flavors, the black currant and the blackberries. If you put it in a small cask, um, 660 liters in size, you have a large surface area of wood, and very little volume of wine. And so as a result, what happens is evaporation, the wines concentrate down, uh, they lose color into the wood, and you end up with aged tawnies. But our most premium style of port is vintage port, and that's one that we put in a bottle after two years, and it lives the rest of its life um, in a bottle. And, and those are some of the longest lived and some of the most fantastic wines in the world. So from the same vineyard, the same making process, the aging, taking place here in Porto creates these incredibly um, interesting styles. Port's international trade history, in particular with the British Empire, has led to other countries producing port-style wines. And while regulations ensure that no other wine is labelled as port within the European Union, it may not be the case in other countries, like the US. So how do you spot authentic port from the Douro Valley? Look for this seal either around the neck or on the back of the bottle, which represents Port's official certifying body. What better pair to a glass of port than a slice of Stilton? Here's how the cheese is made in Nottinghamshire, England. Today we're in the village of Colston Bassett in Nottinghamshire, England, to learn more about how blue Stilton cheese is made. Today we're going to learn about its history and origin and I will also be getting my hands dirty in the process. And then of course we're going to taste it. This cheese can only be made in six dairies which are spread across three counties here in England which are Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire and Derbyshire. And today we're going to visit Colston Bassett Dairy which is one of the six dairies making Stilton cheese. 
Stilton cheese takes its name from the village of Stilton in the east of England. The earliest reports of cheese made and sold here date to the 17th century. In 1724, English writer Daniel Defoe referred to the town being famous for cheese, calling the product the English Parmesan. What contributed to its popularity was that Stilton was relatively close to London, only 70 miles away. The town was on the Great North Road. Built by the Romans, this road was the only link between London and Edinburgh before modern motorways took over. The road passed through villages and market towns filled with coaching inns. One of these was the Bell Inn, where a lady named Frances Paulet sold her cheese to travellers, and the word of her Stilton cheese quickly started to travel with them. And though she probably did not invent the cheese herself, she is responsible for expanding its popularity beyond the village. That was her route to market. It was basically a wayfares for the car carriages, so people would stop overnight, and a lot of the cheese was sold there and taken down into London by travellers. As its popularity grew, Stilton cheese started to be made in the surrounding areas. Today, Stilton production has strict geographical borders and is confined to three counties in England. Ironically, as the village of Stilton falls outside of the county's borders, there can be any cheese made in Stilton, called Stilton. Colston Bassett Dairy was founded in 1913 as a cooperative to save excess milk from farms in the village from going to waste. Today, the dairy works with four farms that supply four million litres of milk a year. Over you know, the last hundred and something years, they've gone from making three months a year, probably making 50, 60 cheese a day, to making seven days a week. And we are doing, in peak, about 180 cheese a day. The farms send the milk to the dairy, where it is pasteurised. What we do is we take the milk, we add a blue mould culture, start a culture to produce acidity, and then we add rennet, which will help us clot the, the milk and turn it into curd. Once we've set it, and it looks like a giant jelly, a giant white jelly, um, we will cut the curd, release the moisture, and we'll drain that moisture off. Quite specific to us, all of our cheese will be hand ladled from that to trolley, and that's just a transfer of curd from one large vessel to another. That will give us moisture release without losing too many fatty proteins to weigh. Um, mechanized processes, large scale business, people who are transferring large volumes can and do lose fatty proteins to weigh. We do, but just less because we're doing it by hand. If you think that ladling is just about transferring the curds from one vat to another, think again. Billy showed me how to do it, and I had a go myself. So the thing to remember is not to dig. Keep it quite flat and just push it through. And that's it? Very good. OK, so you also need to... No. It needs to all come down to the same depth. Oh. So you can have some deep, some not. So it's exactly the same all the way down. Same here. So I'm just going to try one more for the road. Okay. And that bit of cheese is now dead. And you can let Craig have it and we'll get on with it. <laughs> Thank you. So you know when you say, one day I'm going to quit everything and become a cheese maker? <laughs> not, not an easy task, but you have to pick it through. <laughs> So once we've ladled, we will then allow it to settle and again more whey will come out. And then you will drain that whey. And once you start draining the whey, the bacteria that's in, in the curd will start to multiply and produce quite a high level of lactic acid overnight. And then the next morning we'll come in and at a specific lactic acid point, we will break the curds by milling, so it's a uniform size. We'll hand salt the curds, hand mix the curds, and form it up into a, a, a cheese hoop, as you see behind me. The cheese is placed in a warm room to allow some of the mustard to evaporate. The cheese is turned every day, and when it's dry enough and can stand on its own, the mold is taken off. We need to stop the aerobic mold growing at that stage, because if you make it grow too quickly with Stilton, it won't taste right, because you're changing the pH too quickly. So we will take a knife, and we will actually rub the outside of the cheese 
and by rubbing the outside of the cheese we create a barrier so no oxygen can get inside and we stop the mold growth at that or the blue mold growth at that particular stage of production. Then the wheels are turned every day. When they're five or six weeks old, they are pierced to allow oxygen in, which will activate the blue mold and produce the Stilton's characteristic blue veins. Then the cheese matures for another five weeks. Put it on straight and then turn it all the way around. Right, now gently bring it out. So this one, this one is almost ready, yeah? Almost, not quite. I mean, the other end might not be quite so firm because they don't, they don't mature in uniform. So what we should see, it, it'll start the bloom process from the centre and work out. So we can tell, looking at that, it's not ready yet because it's not fully blued. But mind your finger when, you, when you're bringing it back out. So push it to the centre, start, finger on. Now use your other hand. Like that? Finger on, usually your thumb. And, and have it open the gap and then pull it out gently. And then just, just clean it so that that's covering the hole. We've got a slice of freshly cut Stilton, so I'm so excited to give this a try. First thing that I want to point out about this is that it's not that smelly. You know how brew cheeses have this reputation for being so smelly. It's actually all right. Oh, it's so good. It just disappeared. It just melted like that. The texture is nice and crumbly. So even if this is some sort of hard cheese, so it's not that creamy, it actually is is on your palate. It has some like sweet hints at the beginning when you when you first taste it and then you're left with a bit of salty aftertaste which is incredible. I mean you know you get two different flavors in one bite. It's so good I'm gonna have another one. <laughs> the sweetness of the blue veins so good and also if you get a if you get a mini piece without without the blue that in itself it's marvelous and again the texture is incredible so crumbly and uh, it's something that I haven't had with all the blue cheeses. They are kind of gummy. This one is so nice, melts in your mouth. Incredible. Stilton is a registered trademark by the Stilton Cheesemakers Association, which was founded in 1936. The trademark protects the cheese in countries including the US, Canada and Japan. Within the EU, the cheese was also granted the protected designation of origin in 1996. Hand ladling is also at the heart of making traditional raw milk camembert cheese. We are in Normandy, France. Sweet and creamy, camembert holds a special place in the heart of cheese lovers. Today we're in Normandy, France, and uh, we are in the village of Bermondville. We are visiting Les Saint Frères, which is a local farm, to see how traditional farmhouse camembert cheese is made. To be called camembert, a cheese has to weigh at least 250 grams, be 10 centimeters in diameter, and have about 22% fat content. And it has to come from Normandy. This region in northern France is in fact where the cheese was born. Legend has it that it was first made in 1791 in the village of Camembert by Marie Arel, a farmer from Normandy, after a priest from Brie shared cheesemaking tips with her. Although Marie really existed, it's probable that the cheese originated a few centuries earlier, in the 12th century. But thanks to Marie and her family after her, Camembert started to be produced on a larger scale and gained popularity. Fast forward a few hundred years, the Normands still take great pride in it. Le camembert, c'est du lait, du terroir et de l'authenticité. C'est un fromage qui est intimement lié, c'est-à-dire que le, le camembert, c'est vraiment un, le fromage normand. Euh, c'est un fromage à pâte molle euh, où voilà, il y a une croûte fleurie tout autour et c'est vraiment l'emblème de la Normandie, c'est le camembert. 
Le Saint Fer is a family-run farm that grows wheat, rapeseed, barley and other cereals. It makes 400 wheels of camembert every day. Notre entreprise, euh, elle est assez ancienne. Euh, C'est une exploitation familiale et donc euh, elle appartenait à mon grand-père, ensuite à notre père. Et aujourd'hui, avec euh, mes quatre frères, on est cinq garçons. C'est pour ça qu'on a appelé le camembert le cinq frères. C'est parce que voilà, on est une fratrie de cinq frères et qu'on travaille ensemble sur l'exploitation. It takes two liters of milk to make one wheel of camembert. Before being transformed into cheese, the milk has to mature for a day. This allows microorganisms to flourish and to acidify the milk, so when rennet is added, the curd develops faster. Then the milk is ladled by hand five times every hour. Et donc on aperçoit que le, le cahier peut s'égoutter tranquillement, lentement, et voilà, c'est comme ça qu'on peut rajouter du cahier après dans les moules. On ne peut pas faire les cinq fois en même temps parce qu'il n'y a pas assez de place dans les moules pour verser les cinq louches d'une seule fois. Il faut, euh, il faut être patient, il faut attendre une heure entre chaque louche pour euh, laisser le temps au cahier de bien s'égoutter. After ladling, the cheese is salted and left to dry for one day. Ce sont des fromages qui sont, qui sont jeunes, qui ont une journée, ils ont été faits hier. Et donc, là, ils passent une journée dans cette salle-là pour, pour sécher. C'est-à-dire que l'objectif, c'est d'avoir une, une surface bien sèche, qu'il n'y ait plus de lactosérum tout autour du fromage. Et donc, demain matin, je vais les retourner. Et donc là, en fait, on peut voir les cinq louches. Et donc ça, ça veut dire que c'est une fabrication authentique, artisanale. Camembert ages for four to five weeks. This allows a fungus to grow all around the cheese and age it. Il y a un mélange de plusieurs flores dans le... pour faire le camembert, mais principalement au niveau de la, la croûte extérieure, on ajoute du géotrichum et du pénicillium. Et donc au début, elle est toute blanche et plus le fromage s'affine, plus euh, bah, elle vieillit et après le, le fromage il devient un petit peu marron sur les arêtes, sur le tour et le fromage est aussi crémeux. Donc plus on avance dans le temps, plus euh, le fromage il, il change un petit peu de couleur, quoi. il brunit et, et il est plus affiné. Quoi. Traditionally, camembert is packaged in paraffin paper and placed in a wooden box. Pourquoi on l'emballe dans une boîte en bois C'est pour bien euh, que le fromage y soit formé et surtout que la forme du fromage elle reste jusqu'à la fin. Parce que plus le fromage il s'affine après, plus il est crémeux, il est un peu mou. Et donc s'il n'est pas dans une, maintenu dans une boîte en bois, euh, après il coule. Et donc euh, c'est pas joli, on ne peut pas vendre ça. You may associate camembert with a strong, stinky cheese smell. It's actually because of the milk used. C'est-à-dire que c'est du lait cru c'est parce qu'on ne chauffe pas le lait, donc c'est toute la flore qui est dans le lait qui, euh, qui donne cette odeur un petit peu forte. Mais euh, l'odeur est plus forte que le goût. C'est-à-dire qu'en goût, le fromage il est plutôt doux, il est crémeux, il... mais c'est lié au lait cru et au mode de fabrication. Et, à, et aussi à l'alimentation des vaches, parce que du coup, euh, ce que les vaches mangent a une influence sur euh, la nature du lait et donc l'évolution et le goût euh, au final. Quoi. Celui-là, il est, il est assez jeune, il n'est pas encore euh, complètement crémeux. Euh, est, cette partie-là, elle est encore dure. Et donc, il faudrait attendre encore 2, 3 ou 4 semaines pour qu'il soit complètement euh, crémeux. So, this is the camembert that uh, Charles just cut for us. Let's give it a try. Oh, it's nice. <laughs> it's nice, I mean... To be honest, I'm not sure how you could wait two more weeks. <laughs> it's really good. Biting into the outside part of the cheese, you start to get those like typical flavors of camembert. You get the gooiness. You get a bit of a um, sour aftertaste. You can taste more of the milk in here, and you can taste that it's raw milk. Maybe it's not as like creamy as um, you know the one that I'm used to. That is like just the standard one I buy at the supermarket. But again, the flavors here are stronger like the flavors here are more robust and uh, actually if you can see there is there is some creaminess going on in here just by far by far the best one I've ever had regardless of how much time it has it has been on the shelves 
The popularity of the soft creamy cheese has led camembert style cheeses to be made all over the world. France alone makes 360 million wheels of camembert each year, and the cheese has become a symbol of French culture. It was used to feed French soldiers during World War I and even gave its name to the pie chart, which in French is called un diagramme en camembert. More and more dairies have started to pasteurize their milk for health and safety reasons, leaving only a few farmers in France still making it the traditional way, using raw milk, which is permitted in Europe, but forbidden in the US. Les clients sont très attachés à l'origine géographique des produits et donc euh, c'est important de faire du camembert euh, enfin, en Normandie. Et donc on peut faire du camembert euh, ailleurs mais ça n'a pas la même saveur, ça n'a pas le même goût. Et comme on ne réchauffe pas trop le lait, le, le camembert il a vraiment le goût de ce que les vaches mangent ici. Et donc euh, le camembert qu'on fabrique ici à la ferme, euh, il a un goût qu'on ne peut pas euh, imiter. Voilà. In the Sierra de Huelva, Spain, acorns are the secret behind the prestige of Spanish Iberian ham. Today we're in uh, Cortegana in the Sierra de Huelva in uh, Andalusia in Spain to find out all about Iberico ham. Iberian ham, or jamón ibérico, is one of the most expensive meats in the world. A leg of it can cost as much as $4,500. But what is it about this cured meat that makes it cost so much? The reason why it's so prestigious is actually standing behind me. I don't know if you can see, but there are some pigs behind me and they are of, of the special breed called the black Iberian pigs. During their life, they feed mostly on acorns, which are very, very present in the, in the Sierra here. And that's what gives this ham such a special flavor. So today we're going to visit the ham factory to learn more about how the actual ham is made. And then we're going to talk about how it's cut, how it's served and um, tasted to see why it is so special. Black Iberian pigs descend from wild boars and have been considered a delicacy since long before our times. In the year 77, Roman writer Pliny the Elder praised their superior quality. In 1493, when he sailed across the Atlantic for the second time, Christopher Columbus had Iberian pigs aboard his caravels. The most expensive of them all sells for 4,100 euros, which is over $4,500. But despite the high price, this ham remains a local favorite. Black Iberian pigs can be found in the southern and western regions of the Iberian Peninsula, which comprises Spain and Portugal. In Spain, Iberian ham production is confined to the provinces of Salamanca, Huelva, Córdoba, Cáceres and Badajoz. Portugal also produces it under the name Presunto Ibérico. Spanish Iberian ham is protected by the EU's protected designation of origin, the five Spanish provinces where it is produced are split into four different protected designations of origin. Out of the total production of Iberian ham, only 6% comes with a black label, indicating it's the 100% Iberian pure breed. Iberian pigs are raised in an ecosystem known as the Dehesa. It's a zona very quebrada, much sierra, difficult access. Animals that were raised are very hard, they were raised with a bad time, with a lot of frío and with y con las inclemencias de la, de la sierra, pero a su vez da mucho aporte energético, mucho rendimiento. The pigs live in the wild, roaming freely in the dehesa. Per regulations, there shouldn't be more than two pigs per hectare of grassland. The dehesa is rich in olives, nuts and berries, but especially in acorns, called bellotas in Spanish, which are rich in nutrients and fatty acids, basically a superfood for pigs. El cerdo ibérico proviene directamente del jabalí, entonces son cerdos que tienen mucha más masa muscular y menos grasa. Al estar en libertad, toda esa grasa está dentro del músculo y no se, par no se queda en la parte de fuera de, de la carne. So after learning all about the black Iberian pig and why it's such a special pig and different from any on the breed, we are at a local company here in Cortegana, Lazo, to find out about the making process of the hams. Ham comes from the rear leg of the pig. Most companies would also cure the front leg, called paleta, and use the rest of the meat for other products, like chorizo. 
Lasso stores over 150,000 legs in its cellars. Some of the hands made here come from an even rarer breed of the Iberian pig, the Manchado de Jabugo, which has black patches on its skin and can only be found in the Sierra de Huelva. The pigs are killed when they're 15 months old. The hams and paletas are then buried in salt for 15 to 20 days, depending on weight. Eso es lo que hace secar la pieza y, y, y mantenerla en su, en su conservación, que la carne no se pudra. ¿no? After salting, the process starts to gradually slow down. The legs spend about two months in a temperature-controlled room, then they are moved to an airy room for six to nine months. Donde de una forma natural, en la Sierra de Huelva, con unas temperaturas, unas condiciones climatológicas distintas a, a otros sitios, de forma natural el jamón suda, el jamón, la grasa se funde y hace que coja los aromas, los buques, los, los aires de la sierra. Eso transformado después pasa todo al magro, que es la carne. La carne tiene una untuosidad, tiene unas características, unas características completamente distintas a las de otras especies y a las de otra nutrición, a la otra alimentación. The final stage of curing, and also the longest, is the one in cellars. On average, an Iberian ham needs a couple of years to reach its peak flavor, but some legs can cure for much longer. Están más o menos tiempo en función de su peso, pero dos años, tres años, cuatro años pasan aquí. To get a better understanding of how Iberian ham is labeled on the market, we visited Productos de la Sierra, a shop in Seville that sources local products from Andalusia and no farther than 250 kilometers. Para el jamón ibérico hay cuatro tipos de calidad que son representados con cuatro colores. La máxima calidad es el color negro y es el jamón 100% ibérico de bellota. Eso quiere decir que la mamá y el papá del cerdo han sido 100% ibéricos de bellota y se ha criado en libertad alimentado con bellotas. Luego, la siguiente calidad es el color rojo, que sería que la mamá es 100% ibérica, pero el papá es duroc, que es otra raza de cerdo. Los cerdos que son criados en libertad, pero no se han alimentado con bellotas, es el cerdo verde, el precinto verde, que es el cebo de campo. Y luego hay otro estándar de calidad, que es el más bajo, que proviene de ganadería intensiva, que es el precinto blanco. How we know if it's a good ham? Needs to be, you know, soft and the fat needs to melt with a little bit of temperature. So it's a, it's a good one. As with its origin and environment, Iberian ham is carved using a specific technique which can take a lot of time to learn. El jamón ibérico se corta con un cuchillo largo, corto y muy flexible. Es muy importante cortar siempre en dirección del músculo para que el sabor de la grasa y la carne siempre permanezca en la misma dirección. ¿Cuáles son los retos de esta, de esta profesión? Conseguir que tenga la máxima, el máximo número de lonchas cada vez que cortas un jamón y también hay la posibilidad de hacer bonitos diseños con la grasa y con las diferentes lonchas. So this one is our jamón ibérico. This one is 100% ibérico, which is the highest grade. It's cut in like such a divine shape. I've never seen a ham cut like this. You know, you're used to those like very long, just a bit sad <laughs> slices. This one looks like kind of royal. And the room smells so nice, it smells so nice. And actually before I try it, I just want to point out how shiny <laughs> is this fat. So good, I have no words, my voice is gone. <laughs> it's so good. It's not salty, like that's the thing that astonishes me every time that I have like a good quality ham or meat in general, that it doesn't taste like salt, even though it's the main stage of the production, of course. It's just nice and flavorful. Taste is nutty, like you can taste the acorn in here. It really traces back to the actual pig that made this. 
It's really nice, and especially the fat, you should keep it. It's very nice and greasy, adds a bit more of a buttery texture, and the marbling as well, because these pigs are smaller than the usual pigs we're used to, and they, there is more muscles in their legs rather than fat. It's very, very tender, and it really has a different flavor compared to other hams. Not only ham, Spain is home to another traditional cured meat, chorizo. Hola from Sevilla in Spain. Today we're going to find out all about chorizo. So like many European countries, it was the Romans that actually brought the art of making sausages to Spain. And then with time, it actually became the chorizo that we know today. And actually, there is thousands of varieties within the whole country of Spain. So what we're going to do today is see how chorizo iberico is made, which is a local variety here in Seville, and uh, also the finest variety, because it's made from a special breed of pigs. Before seeing how it's made, how do locals like to eat the chorizo? Let's go and find out. Con pan, con rosco, con un buen vino, se acompaña mejor, en las comidas tiene más sabor. El picante me gusta muchísimo. Una buena tapa de chorizo con una cervecita o con un buen vino, pues sabe, es un buen acompañante. Pues, siempre me gusta normal, con su rodadita y a piquito y con una buena cerveza también. El chorizo es muy importante en los huevos revueltos con patatas y chorizo. También se puede utilizar en el famoso cocido de garbanzos y se puede utilizar también en cualquier tipo de arroz. Que no paella. No paella. Chorizo can be either fresh or dry cured. And apart from a standard base of lean pork and lean fat, there are some different varieties. You can get a chorizo blanco, which is made with black pepper, a sweet chorizo made with sweet or bittersweet paprika, or a spicy chorizo made with spicy paprika. El pimentón es muy importante en el chorizo porque le da el color rojo y le da el toque ahumado y el sabor del, del pimentón, del paprika. Es muy importante utilizar especias de mucha calidad en el chorizo porque si utilizamos una especia que tienen menos calidad, el sabor del chorizo también se verá que tiene menos calidad. The variety that is most enjoyed in Andalusia is the Iberian chorizo. Called so because it comes from a special breed of pigs, the black Iberian pig, which roams freely in the region Sierra. La variedad de ibérico es la mejor cuando es alimentado con bellotas, porque es una ganadería extensiva, el cerdo al ser más musculado tiene menos grasa y la carne que tiene y la grasa que le queda es de mucha más calidad y tiene un sabor que es completamente diferente de otro tipo de cerdos. So now it's time to see how chorizos are made and to do that we are at Lazo which is a company in Cortegana in the province of Huelva and uh, here we're going to see the making of two different types of chorizos the one with pimenton and the one without. El chorizo se ha hecho siempre porque es una pieza en la que se utilizan recortes de magro o de carnes un poco más nobles del, del cerdo. Entonces esos recortes, esos trozos pequeños, eh, lo que se hacía es que se, se cortaban, se mezclaba con grasa y tenías otro producto más. Jamones Lazo makes from 7,000 to 8,000 kilograms of chorizos per year. The process starts with ground meat which is mixed by hand with the seasoning, garlic, paprika, and salt. After the meat is ground, it has to rest for about 24 hours, and uh, afterwards, it's placed into tripe. So the process is all done by hand, just the only machine is this one that actually pushes the meat into the tripe, and then the following step is to close the chorizo with a lace all done by hand again. Nosotros utilizamos tripa natural, eh, son chorizos de un tamaño menos más pequeño, son 300 400 gramos, no llega no suele llegar a 500 gramos, porque utilizamos tripa natural mmm, como como la sal que utilizamos o como todo el pimentón. 
So after the chorizo is placed in tripe and is closed with the lace, it's important that it's pierced a few times to allow air into, into the meat, otherwise it would just implode. And actually behind me you can see this, these chorizos are like 10 minutes old, but they have already different colors. So the ones that are at the very end, they're like one hour, a few hours old, and then you know we get gradually to the very, very new ones that were made five minutes ago. You see the air coming in and the chorizo starting to dry within, within minutes. <laughs> you can see also the little pockets of air with the meat that starts to come out and the chorizo starts to breathe. Y después se pasan durante un mes a, unos, a unas cámaras de frío para que vaya perdiendo y vaya tirando eh, la parte de agua eh, que tiene la pieza, que tiene la carne. Ese proceso se va curando y después se saca unos días a, a, a curación natural, que se, se utilizan los mismos espacios que, la, que utilizamos para los jamones, las bodegas en este caso, y ahí se acaban de curar y se acaban de hacer y darle el gusto y el color que habéis, que habéis visto. ¿no? Now back to Seville, where it's finally time to try some chorizos. We have here the one that is sweet one, so without without the spice. Wine that is milder, and then wine that is supposed to be like the strongest. And also we have the actual pimenton. I want to give it a try. I'm not sure if I can yet undo it because I'm not I'm not a spice person to be honest. But you know, for the sake of discovery and for the sake of the video we are going to we're going to try so let's start from the mild one here you go this one is very good i like that it is it is dry but not yet that you know too too dry like sometimes when you have some like dry sausages like even the very common like italian salame that myself as an italian i'm used to are too dry and too salty like that's the problem like this one was quite a big bite but it wasn't salty at all. It was like so flavorful and meaty. Okay, let's go for the mild spicy one. So this one is a bit less dry. So as you can see, it's a bit more meaty. And, um, and yeah, you can see the fat that here is more shiny in here. Start to get the traces on it. This one is so good. I love this fatty, fatty texture that it has and all the oils from the fat. But the real test is coming. The real test is this one, which is <laughs> this one that is the spicy version. Let's have it. There is a bit more spice in there. I feel it, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't bother me. Like my, my mouth is not burning. It's nice, it adds flavor. So it's really a milder spice. Let's see, we have the source here, which is the actual Let's try uh, just a small bit, like this much, because they're telling me from behind the scenes that this one is going to be bad, so very bad. All right, all right, this one is spicy. <laughs> and this one, I suggest that you have it, you know, mixed with something else. Just don't eat pimenton like this off the plate, it's not good. It smells good, it smells smoky it smells like it, it comes from actual peppers which means that at the end when you put in the chorizo you're gonna have a nice chorizo that has nice seasoning on there from andalusia to la mancha we travel to the region where spain's most popular cheese is made manchego Manchego cheese is made in a part of Spain that is called La Mancha, which is just south of Madrid. And uh, today we're in uh, Campo de Montiel, which is a region in La Mancha. We're going to visit La Granja, which is a farm here that's been doing the cheese for over 200 years. We're going to learn about its history and making process, and find out why it is Spain's most popular cheese, as well as what makes it different from all the cheeses in the world that bear the same name. Evidence of cheese making in La Mancha region dates to the Bronze Age. But cheese is not the only thing this region is known for. 
In the 17th century, novelist Miguel de Cervantes brought the region to fame, narrating the adventures of knight-errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, which is the second most translated book in the world after the Bible. Within the region, Manchego cheese is made in the provinces of Toledo, Cuenca, Ciudad Real and Albacete. El queso manchego está muy vinculado a, a la mancha. Eh, desde que se tiene memoria se lleva elaborando queso en esta zona porque es una zona eminentemente ganadera. Siempre ha habido eh, pastoreo y los pastores siempre han utilizado la leche de, de esas ovejas para hacer queso. Entonces el queso y la mancha es una historia que ha ido eh, unida desde que se tiene conocimiento. Finca La Granja is a fifth generation family farm that's been making the cheese since the 19th century. Finca La Granja se, sabemos que se lleva haciendo queso desde 1830, o sea que son casi 200 años de historia en, en la elaboración del queso manchego. Hacemos queso todos los días, elaboramos únicamente el queso con la leche de nuestras propias ovejas que pastan eh, en los campos de alrededor y, y con esa leche fresca eh, elaboramos el queso cuando la leche aún no está, cuando la leche no tiene aún ni, ni 24 horas de vida. Y es un factor muy importante para nosotros porque al, al ser queso elaborado con leche cruda, pues transmitimos eh, todos ese, esos beneficios y esa seña de identidad que, que nos da nuestra, nuestra ganadería. The dairy makes about 65 wheels of manchego cheese per day. The cheese is made with milk from the previous evening and morning milk that's fresh. El proceso comienza con el filtrado de la leche, la colocamos en la cuba y, y el maestro quesero va jugando con el tiempo y la temperatura para cuajar esa leche. En el momento preciso la línea del cuajo y deja que cuaje hasta que, hasta que él considera el punto óptimo de corte de la cuajada. Esa cuajada se corta muy, muy sutilmente, muy despacito para, para que el maestro quesero consiga el, el momento perfecto de, y el grano, el tamaño y la textura perfecta en esa cuajada. Después se deposita en la mesa y se va introduciendo a mano en los moldes. Eso es muy importante porque al final es la mano del quesero el que, la que determina cómo va a ser el queso. Se va metiendo a mano uno por uno formando cada pieza. The mold is very important because it is what actually gives the cheese its signature pattern. It's all printed inside and then after being placed into molds, the cheese is placed into a press. and uh, it's pressed for about four hours and after these four hours it's going to be moved to brines. Each wheel is labelled with a unique plaque of milk protein. In the past, manchego cheese used to be shaped in these baskets made of esparto grass. Esta era la forma tradicional que tenían los pastores de hacer el queso. Esto se llama flor y está diseñada para, para permitir que el suero salga con el hierro de, de la finca. Y esto se llama pleita, que está hecha con esparto trenzado. Yo recuerdo a mi, a mi abuelo eh, eh, elaborando, eh, elaborando queso con, con estas pleitas. Y lo que solían hacer era poner la flor, eh, la pleita encima, aquí ponían un, molde, un paño de algodón y ese paño de algodón lo llenaban con la cuajada del queso. Luego ponían otra flor encima y la ponían en las prensas, en los entremisos. After the wheels are taken out of the brines, they are placed in a drying room. As you can see behind me, we have different blocks of cheese. We have just here on my right, the ones that were made just yesterday, and then going forward we have two days ago, three days ago, four days ago, up until one month. El moho es muy especial para, para nosotros, es una contaminación ambiental, es completamente natural, pero lo que hace es proteger el queso. Cuando el queso ya está cubierto de moho como, como este, el frío y la, eh, de las cámaras incide de una forma mucho más, mucho más lenta. El moho ayuda a que el queso guarde humedad y sobre todo da muchísimo aroma. A mí me encanta, por ejemplo, lanzar las esporas al aire al final. Eh, lo que hacemos con el volteo de diario del queso es estas esporas, ¿no? este moho, lo lanzamos al aire y esas esporas van colonizando los, los diferentes quesos y van creciendo y van y se van reproduciendo, pero bueno, al final eh, creemos que, que merece la pena tener un producto tan natural como este. Manchego cheese matures for at least two months. 
cheese that matures from two to six months is called semicurado, and it becomes curado when the maturation exceeds six months. Y lo que hacemos luego es cuando el queso tiene dos meses, eh, limpiamos ese mo y damos una capa de aceite de oliva virgen en la corteza. De esa forma conseguimos nutrir la corteza del queso. El queso va a estar más, la corteza va a estar un poquito más suave. Eh, frenamos un poquito que, eh, que se seque, que se siga secando. Y luego, posteriormente, cuando el moho vuelva a crecer, pues eh, crecen otras, otras cepas con otra, incidencia, con otra incidencia de moho que ya dejarán listos para, para ser eh, cepillado otra vez y, y listos para poner a la venta. So next to me is a five-month-old manchego cheese. This one is semi-hard, semi-curado, they say in Spanish. And uh, we got some slices that Gabriel has got for us. It smells very nice. Throughout my cheese journey, I learned to become a fan of raw milk cheese. <laughs> so I actually have high expectations for this one. So nice. It's very good. I like it. It's got, it's got some like tangy aftertaste. I think that is because it's been aged for more than the two, the two months. That is the minimum. Very good. You taste the raw milk. You can taste that this comes from sheep's milk and it's not cow's milk. And it has a different, different texture as well in your mouth. And um, I like it. It's somewhere in between crumbly and a bit battery, so you get both of them depending on you know when you actually bite into it and when you chew it. Again, the fact that this one has matured more than the minimum has made it better. Despite the fact that the cheese takes its name from the Spanish region where it originated, other Spanish-speaking countries call their cheeses manchego. So what is the difference? When the Spanish conquistadors landed in Mexico, they brought with them the art of cheese making, manchego cheese included. Today, Mexican manchego shares very little with its Spanish namesake, as it is made with cow's milk and is usually matured for a shorter time. But Spanish cheesemakers are not happy to share their cheese's name with others. Within the EU, Spanish manchego cheese is protected by the Protected Designation of Origin status, which prevents cheeses not from La Mancha from being called manchego. In April 2018, a new trade deal with Mexico granted the EU exclusive rights for 340 products with a geographical indication, but excluded Spanish manchego. So at this stage, the two cheeses coexist, and the row is sure to be continued. Talking about popular cheeses, how about some Emmentaler? Here's how the Swiss cheese gets its iconic holes. and today I'm at the Emmentaler Chalcaserai to show you how traditional Emmentaler cheese is made. Now I'm actually in the village of Affolton in Emmental, which is in a region just east of Bern. 80% of all Emmentaler production comes from this region with 150 producers. And its name comes from here. There's the nearby river Emme and Tal, meaning valley in German. In the US, it's known as Swiss cheese. Emmentaler has iconic holes in it, and it's also the world's largest cheese. Emmentaler AOP can only be produced in these regions in Switzerland. It was granted AOP protection from the EU in 2002, meaning that these areas are the protected designation of origin but there are a few qualifications for this. The milk has to be from dairy farms no fewer than 20 kilometers away, and it must be produced using raw milk. 17,700 tons of Emmentaler are produced each year in this region by 150 family dairies. Cheese production started in this area over 200 years ago it's a hilly region 
so good for cattle grazing. The Emmentaler Schalkaiserei show dairy was opened in 1989. The process of cheese starts at the farmer, so uh, we need a high quality raw milk. Then we heat up the milk on 32 degrees. We put inside uh, the bacteria, the rennet. We have to wait because the rennet make a relationship between the fat and the protein. You are cutting the curds down to a size of four up to six millimeters. And then you're heating up another time to 53 degrees. You're pumping up to the forms and then you are pressing that for 12 hours. The cheese is pressed under hydraulic pressure for up to 12 hours. It then spends eight weeks in the warm fermentation cellar at 22 degrees Celsius. It then goes into a storage cellar for up to two months before it's collected by the wholesaler. This makes a famous sweet taste and smooth texture of the cheese. The world famous holes, they're created by a reaction in the bacteria. After one month of storage, a strain of bacteria, Propionibacterium shermani, consumes lactic acid and releases carbon dioxide. These bubbles become trapped in the cheese rind and form holes, also known as eyes. But why are the cheeses so large? The size of Emmentaler wheels is heavily regulated, as most have a diameter of 80 to 100 centimetres. They need to be a minimum of 75 kilograms. The cheese produced here, a kilogram costs 19 Swiss francs or $19, so one wheel could cost over $1,900. We have to pay taxes also in Switzerland, and 200 years ago they have the regulation that you have to pay the taxes on a piece and not on kilogram, so they make a big cheese wheel and they have to pay only once the taxes and still 200 years we are producing this uh, at minimum 75 kilogram wheels. The cheese is matured into a four month classic, eight month reserve, 12 month AOP extra and the 24 month Loire d'Emmental. The taste of, of the Emmental AOP uh, it's unique. Um, in Compared to um, copies, it's comparing if you take a, a red wine and a good red wine. We visited the Chalcaise Rai restaurant to try the cheese. And we go for the classic, it's four month age. What you can see is the springy kind of rubbery texture to it. Uh, let's give this a try. Mm. It's so much more flavoursome than other Emmentaler that I've had. It has a really full flavour to it because it's made with raw milk, not pasteurised milk that you might get in the States. Uh, it's just a very, very kind of full, rich, milky flavour that uh, is very tasty. But how does this differ to the 12 month aged? It's a lot less kind of springy and bouncy to the touch, um, but that rich, nutty flavour is really starting to come through. This room downstairs when we went into here in the dairy was the room that it's the minute you walk in, there's a beautiful nutty aroma that hits you and that is exactly what you can get in the cheese now. It's gone from sort of like a fruity, mild cheese to something which is, has you know, this texture to it and it's very nutty. To be an authentic Emmentaler cheese, it needs to have the Emmentaler logo and a bespoke cheese number. On the rind, we put uh, our brand on top before we press the cheese, and this is something like a tea bag. And this is growing directly into the rind. So, if you are cutting the cheese wheel into pieces, um, on each rind, you should find um, a part of this Emmentaler Switzerland logo, and you find also a little number on top. And with this number, our customers can go on our website, emmentaler.ch, and give this number inside, um, and Google Maps shows you where this product was produced in which dairy. And the dairies need to have this protection. Emmentaler is the world's most copied cheese. 
So 95 percent of that what is uh, sold as a Swiss cheese or a cheese with holes uh, called Emmental are fake Emmentaler. So the Emmentaler Switzerland, um, the brand is protected by the AOP label and we have also a bacteria inside our cheese. We are the only brand, cheese brand, who are using this one. And so we can um, not only look on the package if it's original Emmentaler AOP, um, we can also analyze this this product and so these are our activities and the brand um, itself we have people who are working only for searching the region between the copies so it's a big um, work behind here. Not far from the Emmental region is Gruyere. You guessed it, this is where Gruyere cheese comes from. When you think of Swiss cheese, you think of holes, right? But Emmentaler isn't actually the most popular cheese in Switzerland. Gruyere is the most produced and most consumed cheese in the country. We're here to see how it's made and find out why it's the main component of a Swiss fondue. We're actually in the town of Gruyere, which is in the French-speaking region of Fribourg, near Geneva. Fribourg is one of the five areas, including Bern, Jura, Vold and Neuchâtel, that make up the Gruyère AOP production zone. Gruyère has a long heritage. Records of cheese making go back to the 12th century in this region. Legend has it that in the year 161, the Roman Emperor Antoninus Pius died after eating too much Gruyère. Today, 30,000 tonnes of Gruyère are produced here each year. The Maison de Gruyère is responsible for 520 tonnes of that. In 2018, over 15,000 tonnes of Gruyère were sold in Switzerland, making it the most consumed cheese in the country, ahead of mozzarella and Emmentaler. Gruyère was granted AOP protection from the EU in 2001, meaning that these areas are the protected designation of origin. But there are a few qualifications for this. It must be made using traditional know-how. It must be aged to a minimum of five months. And it must be made using raw milk from natural fed cows, from dairies no more than 20 kilometers away. Milk is supplied twice a day a vat containing 4,800 litres of unpasteurised milk is used to produce 12 wheels of Gruyere AOP at a time. 48 wheels are produced daily. The cheesemaker adds starter cultures made from whey to mature the milk. Rennet is also added to curdle the milk. This sets the milk into a junket after 40 minutes. Knives, called cheese harps, are used to cut the curd. The vat is gradually heated up to 57 degrees Celsius until the curds are the size of wheat grains. The cheesemaker must check the texture and size of these carefully. The contents of the vat are then pumped out onto moulds and the whey is drained away. Each wheel is then pressed for 24 hours. The following day, each wheel is dipped in a concentrated salt bath for 24 hours. After, it is taken to the cellars where it is constantly turned and the rind is washed. The cheese is stored at around 15 degrees Celsius. The cheese also has to be kept on wooden shelves. A cellar like this houses around 7,000 wheels of cheese. Gruyere is aged here for five months, at which point it's ready to eat. For a sharper taste, it can be aged up to 16 months. I'm going to give them a try and see whether I can tell the difference between the different ages. First one I'm going to try is the six month age Gruyere. The rich kind of nuttiness hasn't come through as much yet. It's still quite a mild cheese at this stage. Now it's the eight month age Gruyere. Wow. There's such a difference in flavour between the two of them. 
Also the texture of it, you can get slightly more grainy and a much richer flavour to this one. I know this is going to be the strongest flavour because it's the longest age. So all three of these go into making a fondue, which we're going to try. We couldn't come here without trying fondue moitié moitié, also called fondue suisse. In many Swiss regions, Gruyere cheese is the most popular ingredient in fondue. Another important component for a great fondue here is the vacherin. And what it does is it gives it a consistency. So it's not just Gruyere that goes into an amazing fondue. It's so rich and so creamy. You can definitely taste a bit of punch from the more mature flavours of cheese in there. It's just the absolute real deal. That is the best fondue I've ever had. On top of fondue, you can find Gruyere in French onion soup, croque monsieur, cordon bleu, quiche, the list goes on. It's a versatile and popular cheese for cooking because it has a taste that's distinct but not overpowering. A wheel of Gruyere is between 55 and 65 centimetres in diameter and weighs between 25 and 40 kilograms. Have you noticed the writing on the side of the rind? Le Gruyere AOP is inscribed on every authentic wheel. Each wheel must have a casein mark and the number of the cheese factory. It must also have the date of production on it. You might be thinking, wait, why doesn't this Swiss cheese have holes in it? The French variety of Gruyere is required to have holes and receives IGP protection. In Switzerland, Gruyere receives AOP protection and it's a smooth texture. As Gruyere is such a popular cheese, how does the Maison de Gruyere protect itself against copycat products? Gruyere is a well-known name, so um, it's a high-quality product and uh, as uh, like uh, a watch, for example, you, you make a fake uh, Gruyere and we find some fake Gruyere on the market and we can find who is the producer of this fake Gruyere, we attack him. The name Gruyere is protected around the world, in Switzerland, Russia, Europe, South Africa and the USA. Let's take a breath of fresh air and soak up some sun on the Amalfi Coast, where giant lemons are turned into limoncello. We are at Villa Divina, a wonderful villa on the Amalfi Coast in the city of Vietri, where they grow lemons that, as you can see, can reach very, very big sizes. They have here, they have about 600 lemon trees, and um, it's all grown using no pesticides. They're all hand-picked, and uh, this is where the production line starts. So we're gonna go and see how they're harvested. Limoncello is one of the most popular Italian liquors. The yellow drink is made in southern Italy, in particular in the sunny Sicily, the Gulf of Naples and the Amalfi Coast. Mostly because these areas offer the perfect soil and weather conditions to grow lemons. Villa Divina supplies lemons to Pallini, a company established in 1875 in a small village near Rome that specializes in Italian liquors such as Sambuca and Mistra. Pallini Limoncello production started in the 90s and today Pallini makes almost 1 million litres of the lemon liqueur per year. Limoncello is a very traditional Italian liqueur. It's really a family tradition. Most Italian families do it at home. The key to limoncello is the quality of its ingredients and the procedure. So as every family, especially being a producer of liqueur, we had our proprietary family recipe. And uh, around the end of the in the 90s actually, uh, limoncello became fashionable, also in more of an industrial production, not just a family recipe. 
uh, and so we started producing our own our own recipe. Also, family recipes generally are very high in alcohol proof. So what we did, we had to counterbalance it in order to have the flavor of the perfumes come out and become balanced uh, with the tartness and the sweetness, so that none of them overcomes the other. The type of lemon used for making Palini Limoncello is the Sfusato Amalfitano, also known as Amalfi Lemon. These lemons are protected by the Protected Geographical Indication, or PGI, from the EU, delimiting a specific area where they can be grown that comprises the 13 towns of the Amalfi Coast. Approximately 100,000 tons of lemons are harvested each year in 40 hectares across the coast. The key quality of the Amalfi lemons is that they are grown using no pesticides. This special lemon cannot really travel because uh, it's not classified organic, but the way it's grown is very similar to an organic lemon. So these lemons, if you have them in your fridge, actually go bad after two, three weeks. They don't <laughs> resist. If you buy them in the supermarket, uh, you see the lemons can stay for months without really changing anything. Uh, these are lemons that um, they have, they, the lemon peel is extremely rich in lemon oils, if you put, if you dig your fingernail in the peel, you actually see the lemon oil coming out, uh, so rich as it is. And this gives the, the limoncello a totally different flavor. So this is one of the freshly harvested lemons and uh, here at Pallini they say that these lemons are special not just because they are massive but also because they are the only lemons that you can literally eat like an apple. So we're going to put this to the test and uh, literally bite into this lemon slice. Wow, incredible but true, this is the first lemon that I have. The taste is almost sweet. Like the inside in here, of course, it, it's a bit tangy, but it's not, you know, you don't get the same reaction when you go like, oh, that was really strong when you eat like your standard supermarket lemon. But what's interesting is the zest here. It's very soft. It's not, it's not really an apple. It's even softer than an apple. I would say this is like melon, maybe, you know, one of those like orangey lemons. They are like very, very soft and juicy. And, um, now there is no aftertaste. I uh, I could like easily finish this. It's really like a good snack to have on its own. <laughs> the average weight of an Amalfi lemon is no fewer than 100 grams, and the lemons are typically harvested between spring and summer. When they're ready, lemons are harvested by hand, peeled, sealed, and then sent to Palini's distillery in Rome within 24 hours. Qui vengono portate le bucce, queste vengono messe in infusione con un tot di alcol, un tot di bucce. È lì in realtà che sta il, chiamiamolo segreto, tot di alcol e tot di bucce, anche il tempo di infusione è importante. Ti posso dire, va da un minimo di tre giorni o un massimo di una settimana. Ci sono degli studi che sono stati fatti, a seconda quindi di quanto alcol usi, di quanto bucce usi, e del tempo di infusione hai un flavor, un gusto, un sapore differente. During the infusion, the lemon peel transfers all its flavor and richness to the alcohol to get the yellow liquor we call limoncello. This is why the use of a superior quality lemon, like the Amalfi lemon, is so important. This means that when you do the infusion, since the key, the heart of limoncello is the lemon peel infusion and you cannot wash the lemons with chemicals, otherwise you would have them in the infusion. This is why it's so important that there are no pesticides on the, on the peel, because otherwise in the alcohol infusion you would extract the pesticides even before extracting the flavor of the lemons. Uh, moreover, these peels are very, very thin. Uh, and this mm, and very rich in lemon oils and this makes the infusion even much richer in, in perfumes and flavor and it gives it a special sweet tartness that has uh, that limoncello palini has a 
sample of the infusion is tested to establish the alcoholic strength by volume and corrected if necessary. After that, the limoncello is ready to be bottled. The production line at Pallini's distillery in Rome bottles 9,000 litres every half hour. Up the coast of Scotland, locks are some of the best places to farm oysters. Hey, it's Leon and welcome to Scotland. We're in Loch Fine to find out how Loch Fine oysters are farmed and why they're so special. I'm also heading down to the local oyster bar to try and decide what the best way of serving them is. Down the hatch we go. Loch Fine farms Pacific oysters, which can be found at various locations on the Scottish coast. Pacific oysters constitute of 80% of the global oyster trade and were introduced to the UK in 1964 to replace low stocks of the British native oysters. The native variety can be more expensive and rare, but also riskier to consume. But if these oysters are harvested all around the world, including France, Australia and New Zealand, what makes Scottish ones so special? Local landowner Johnny Noble and marine biologist Andy Lane started the Loch Fine Oyster Farm in 1978. Since then, they've grown it into a global business. They export internationally to Barbados, South Africa and Hong Kong, as well as stocking in prestigious London retailers. Their oysters were even served at Formula One and the Champions League finals. The Scottish locks have cool weather in the spring for the start of harvest season in April. And this lock in particular is of class A purity at least six months of the year. Absolutely pristine conditions. It's what you're looking for. As you can see, there's no industry. There's maybe a couple of houses. So they're feeding on the best possible feed that you could want. The water that you're growing the oysters in, again, I can't stress enough how good it is. In heavily populated areas, you run the risk of norovirus as well as other things in the water and safety here is paramount. Loch Fine monitors the water here constantly for toxins, as do the local authorities. To eliminate viruses, each oyster undergoes a series of checks, starting the moment it arrives from the hatchery. The oysters are grown for up to three years in specialized baskets, which allow for movement and controlled exposure to the tide. These are called SEPA baskets. When the tide comes in, that actually moves these baskets. That'll gently just knock off any excess growth that we've got in the oysters and give a better shape to the oyster and a better meat content to the oyster. And these trestles at the low tide mark, twice a day, no matter what the weather is, they are out of water and have got to keep themselves shut. That gives them a stronger muscle. And this process also affects the experience of enjoying an oyster. By regulating their size to about 120 grams for the largest and 65 to 75 grams for the smallest, they can ensure the correct oysters go for cooking and the others are more appropriate for an enjoyable mouthful. The water also affects the flavour of the oyster. By growing the oyster in a lock with lower salt levels, you get a more pleasant salinity. Also, as they're grown in a lock and not open coastal waters, there's little disturbance on the seabed, which would otherwise make the oysters gritty. Any oysters imported from local producers need to de-stress after their journey. They're counted into bags of 100 to 150 from partner growers and placed in stillages by the waterside, before being taken into the grading shed, then the depuration shed. Tanks containing water from the lock have to be kept between 8 and 18 degrees Celsius to avoid the produce closing up. This is the depuration process, where the oysters are purified under UV light for a minimum of 42 hours to kill off any nasty bacteria. The tanks are then drained and the oysters are packaged. Loch Fine prides itself on its produce's long shelf life. But how does the company ensure that each oyster is fresh? 
So what we would do is when we're packing the oysters, we'd pick up two oysters and we would tap them together. Two oysters getting tapped together should sound like two stones getting tapped together. And what that means is you've got a good healthy oyster that is going to last. Now if an oyster's gaping like that, that means it's dead. Okay, it's not like mussels. With mussels, you can give them a little tap and the uh, muscle will shut back over again, absolutely fine. If oysters gape, then that's them. The nearby Lockfine Oyster Bar sells them for £2, or $2.44 each. Just so good at our oysters. <laughs> our, our oysters are, I mean, I get them every day. Uh, five days a week, my oysters come in, sometimes six days a week. They're just from over there, across the loch, and you can tell how fresh they are. But do they taste as good as they look? I'm going to go for it without anything on it first because I just really want to get a taste of what the oyster actually tastes like. It's actually really subtle. I think oysters I've had in the past have been quite slimy. This one definitely wasn't. They slide down the hatch, but you can chew them. There's a, definitely a texture to them. The oysters here are served with this onion vinegar, so I'm going to squeeze a bit of lemon and then have the onion vinegar one. I like anything that's pickled, so adding the vinegar element to the really salty oyster is is actually really good. Um, I have been brought this Tabasco. I'm not going to put any on here because I feel like these oysters don't need to be overpowered by the flavour of the Tabasco sauce. So far, the fresh oyster with lemon is my favourite. But what are the cooked ones like? We have one that has anchovy, smoked cheddar and some chilli sauce. And then this is just garlic cheese breadcrumbs. <sighs> This is so early in the morning to be eating oysters. <laughs> I absolutely love anchovies. I've never had one on an oyster, so it works. The chili sauce is like a nice sweetness to it that probably you do need when you've got something that salty. Garlic, butter and breadcrumbs. It's like a little mini fish pie. That's exactly what it was like, a mini little fish pie. <laughs> it was really nice for me, the king. If you're going to eat oysters, eat them, eat them fresh, eat them alive. Loch Fine exports nearly 35,000 oysters every week, just over 1.8 million a year. Production here might be at a comparatively smaller scale, but the business has won multiple awards for its taste and quality, including the Queen's Award for Excellence International Trade. We have a group called the ASSG, which is the Association of Scottish Shellfish Growers, who meet every year and uh, we try and develop the industry every year. It's not a big industry at the moment, but the good thing about the industry is it's, it's quality motivated. And just like ourselves here, it depends on local communities. Would you ever have guessed fish is one of the ingredients of Worcestershire sauce? Here's how the staple British sauce is made. Hello, today we're in the West Midlands of England, in Worcestershire, the home of Lee and Perrins. We're going to see how they make their famous Worcestershire sauce. Today we're going to find out about its history and origin, what makes it so popular here in the UK, and then of course we're going to taste it. Worcestershire sauce is a condiment made through a long-established maturing process with malt and spirit vinegar, molasses, red onions, garlic, anchovies, tamarind and secret seasoning. The sauce can be enjoyed in a variety of ways, used to complement steaks, burgers, cocktails such as a Bloody Mary, and a British favourite, cheese on toast. But how did this famous sauce come into existence here in the West Midlands? So Liam Perrins is steeped in over 180 years of history. You know, the story starts uh, in 1835 with Lord Sandys, who was uh, reputedly a nobleman of this county, and he'd been travelling in the Far East and had picked up this recipe for a sauce. And he loved it so much, he brought it back to Worcester and wanted it made up. He turned to uh, a couple of entrepreneur chemists, Mr. Lee and Mr. Perrins, who owned a chemist shop in the centre of Worcester in Broad Street. Uh, so he gave them the recipe. Uh, Mr. Lee and Mr. Perrins got the ingredients from around the world and made up the sauce. And you know what? It tasted awful. 
Lord Sandys never returned. And Mr. Lee and Mr. Perrins put this uh, mixture in the basement of their chemist shop and didn't return to it until a couple of years afterwards when they tried it and it had matured into this wonderful elixir and so started the kind of global fame of Lee and Perrins into what it is today. After discovering their newfound popular sauce, the pair began selling it from their Broad Street chemist, which was quickly becoming popular with locals in the area. Lee and Perrins then relocated to a new factory in Worcester in 1897, where the sauce is still made today. Depending on your region, it will either be packaged in the iconic orange label or wrapped in a beige paper wrapper. So at the site here in Worcester, we do mainly Liam Perrin's production in glass bottles. 70-80% um, uh, of what we do is Liam Perrin, so quite a lot of volume. And also we also produce around about 43 million bottles a year. So depending on the bottle size that we're running at the time, we can run anything from two and a half tonnes an hour up to five and six tonnes per hour in terms of productive source. Paul escorted us around the factory, showing us the making process. We started in the basement, where hundreds of barrels sit quietly maturing the Worcestershire sauce ingredients, just like it did over a hundred years ago. Paul starts by showing us one of the three main ingredients that go into Liam Perrin's sauce, whole red onions. So we got some red onions here that have been pickling for around about nine to 10 months. And we've still got the whole red skin onion, which we noticed, but it's changed from being a very hard fruit, even though it's keeping its color, to being a little bit mushy. And it's the process of breaking down the vegetable that creates this lovely juice that comes out that will give us that lovely flavour. The same process is also done with whole garlic cloves, which also sit in a barrel of malt vinegar to pickle for 18 months. But one of the most interesting ingredients sitting in these barrels are anchovies, and there are lots of them. The fish, which are captured and sent from Spain, aging 200 kilograms of salt for two years, which helped bring out the base flavor for the sauce. After the ingredients have finished maturing, they then go to the making house, where they are mixed together. The garlic, onions, anchovies and salt are added into this 5,000 liter tank. It then goes to the maturation storage area, where the ingredients are transferred and held in a larger 30,000 litre tank for a minimum of six weeks, adding more ingredients, including their secret spices, further enhancing the maturing process. Once complete, the sauce then goes to the final stage where it gets pasteurized. The sauce first goes through this holding tank before heading to the heat exchanger, which preheats the sauce for around two minutes, then cools it again before sending it to bottling. It's finally time to try the Worcestershire sauce. One thing to keep in mind is that this sauce has basically everything that I hate. I'm not a big fan of vinegar, anchovies, uh, garlic, onions, and all these strong, strong flavors. I think the winning point in here is that you don't taste the fish. I could never tell that there is fish in here. I can taste the vinegar and the garlic and the onions. You know, like if you compare this to like the, the standard vinegar that you have on the market, this will taste more like a balsamic vinegar because it has some sweet notes. I have made a very sad looking cheese on toast. So what we've done here is we put a little bit of the Lee and Perrins sauce uh, just on top of the cheese before uh, putting this onto the grill. 
Oh yeah, there is souls in here. <laughs> I think this one is a very, a very good option. The souls actually elevates it. So overall, not for me, but it's still a great souls. Popular all over the world, cheddar cheese takes its name from a small village in the West Country, England. Cheddar cheese is named after a small village in the West Country in England. We're here to watch the traditional method of making it and find out why cheesemakers restarted the centuries-old tradition of storing it in caves. The Cheddar Gorge Cheese Company is the only dairy in this village, so we're about to see the real deal. About 333,000 tonnes of cheddar are produced in the UK per year. To get the official protected designation of origin label, West Country Farmhouse Cheddar, the cheese has to be made in one of the four counties, Cornwall, Devon, Somerset, Dorset. The cheese must be made from milk from grazing herds no more than 30 miles from the farm. It has to be made from a traditional recipe. The curds need to be turned by hand and it must be aged to a minimum of nine months. The earliest record of cheddar anywhere is at Cheddar in Somerset in 1170. The land around this village has been at the heart of English cheese making since the 15th century. Today, as many cheddar producers have upscaled and required more land, there is only one traditional cheesemaker left in the village. The Cheddar Gorge Cheese Company produces 60 tonnes of cheese each year. But certainly down here you have the Somerset levels and then you have the top of the Cheddar Gorge and each year you would get a lot of water coming down from the gorge uh, bringing a lot of silt which really made the pastures verdant and very very nutritious. In the morning 2,000 litres of milk is delivered from a farm four miles away. It takes around 10 litres of milk to make one kilogram of cheddar. The milk is agitated, which mixes the fat evenly through the milk. Some farmhouse producers use pasteurised milk, but here it's raw milk. If we use it unpasteurised, we need to know that the quality of the milk and the safety is fine. The farm that we get it from has Friesian, Holston Friesians, British Friesians. A vegetarian replacement for rennet is then added which sets the milk into a junket. This is cut to form curds and whey. The curds and whey are heated to about 40 degrees Celsius to make the curds solid. This influences the moisture level in the finished product. Cheeses like Gorgonzola and Mozzarella have a lot of moisture in them, so they go off very quickly. Whereas Parmesan has little moisture, so lasts for a long time. Cheddar is somewhere in the middle, around 40%. The starter cultures develop and multiply. The whey is drained away. Next, the all-important cheddaring process, where the curds, now having the texture of chicken breasts, are turned and cut. What cheddaring does is it squeezes the curd and forces more whey out of it. And gradually it'll get drier and drier and the texture changes very quickly. The curd is salted by hand to preserve it and milled into small chips It's pressed into a 25 kilogram mould and left overnight. In the morning, it's dipped in hot water to smooth the edge of the cheese and remove the imprint of the cloth. It's then treated with a vegetarian-based substance. The use of cheesecloth 
is a vital way of allowing the cheese to gradually dry and develop a rind. The only thing that identifies it is a tag that states the date of production and the weight of the cheese. The mellow, mature and vintage cheddars are all stored on site, where they are turned, and the free mould is vacuumed away. The cave mature variety is carried into the famous Goffs Cave in the Mendip Hills. The constant temperature and humidity, nearly 98%, provide perfect conditions in which to mature cloth-bound cheese. The moisture content is a critical component and it ensures the cultures and enzymes move on more quickly, producing a more complex flavour. It takes on the natural yeast and mould from the atmosphere in the cave, leading to an earthy flavour. The cheese's strength is defined by the length of the ageing, for mellow cheddar, it's four to six months. Mature, 10 to 12 months. And vintage, 20 to 24 months. Cave matured should have less of a bite at 12 months old. We tried some out to see if there's a taste difference between the maturations. So the first one I'm going to have a little bite of is the cave matured cheddar. It's really creamy. It almost has the consistency of quite a medium mild cheddar. You can tell the difference of the rinds here. So I've got the cave aged one, which has sort of like that really damp, quite dark colour on the rind of it. And then I've got the vintage one, which is just a little bit lighter. Okay, now to try some of this. Wow, the flavour of that is incredible. It has such a kick to it and such a bite. Immediately when you cut into vintage cheddar, you want there to be almost a flakiness to it. And that's exactly what this has got. The company is the first one in recent memory to reintroduce cheddar cheese back into a natural cave environment to mature. The PDO label was set up to protect the industry from non-genuine products. So why did the Cheddar Gorge Cheese Company opt out of it? Some years ago, we had PDO status for our cheese, but we deliberately opted out of it. So with a PDO, you can make it from pasteurised milk. We make all ours from unpasteurised. Um, with a PDO, you can mature it in plastic. We mature ours in cloth. And we are still doing the things that would enable us to qualify for PDO. What we've just done is go on a little bit further, quite a lot further. In London, we take a look at how traditional crumpets are made at a bakery that churns out 36,000 of them per hour. Hello, today we're in Enfield in London to find out how traditional crumpets are made. And uh, for those of you who don't know, crumpets are a very British thing. They are similar to toast, similar to pancakes, similar to bread, but they're neither bread, neither pancakes. So today we are at Warburton's, which is the UK's largest crumpet producer. Imagine, in Enfield alone, they make 36,000 crumpets per hour. British crumpets. So what are they exactly, and how did they become so popular within British cuisine? It is said that crumpets originated in the Anglo-Saxon period during 410 and 1066, and they were originally known as pikelets. They were small, hard, oval-shaped biscuits cooked on a griddle and had a pancake-like appearance. During the Victorian era, the recipe was altered to include the yeast and bicarbonate soda to give them a soft, spongy look. What about its name? Its origins are unclear, but there are a few suggestions saying it may have come from a 14th century reference to a crumpet cake, which was a crumpled and curled up cake, and the old English word crumpeth, which also means crumpled.
Warburton's as a business, we, we were founded back in 1876 in Bolton uh, and over the last 140 years we have grown and grown from a, a local business to a regional business to now a national business to be the number one bread brand in the UK. Within British culture, the crumpets plays, played a really important part because it is a staple of a British diet effectively. Um, we see it traditionally over the years, it's always been a breakfast accompaniment, so rather than toast, people would have crumpets with jam, but we've seen that evolve as well. And, and over the years, people now are starting eating crumpets with ham and cheese on top, and it's become more of a, a meal accompaniment. So the, the process of actually making a crumpet is quite quite complicated and technical, but very simple in its approach. So we take our raw material, so flour, water, yeast, a little bit of brine. But what we then do is we need to activate the yeast. So the mixing process will generate a bit of heat and start to get the, the batter warming up to around 40 degrees. At that point, the yeast starts to activate. And part of that process is that the yeast will start to consume the sugars that are present in flour. And as they're consuming the sugar, they're actually, as a byproduct, releasing carbon dioxide. That's the magic. We then take that and deposit it onto a hot plate. So the hot plate runs at about 200 degrees, and we deposit fixed amounts of batter into the rings. As the batter hits the hot plate, it will set the base of the crumpet. But as the heat then starts to go through the base, it starts to heat the water and boil the water, and the water turns to steam. And as the water and the crumpet and the heat's going through the batter, we're actually expanding the CO2 bubbles. So what happens then is as the bubbles expand and the steam is looking for the easiest way out, it's pushing the CO2 up through the batter. As that comes through the batter, it's actually setting the walls of the hole. So when the gas is released, that's how we form the holes in a crumpet. The surfaces of the crumpets are then toasted for around 20 seconds to give them the finishing touch. What you may find interesting is that the crumpet doesn't need to be toasted at all, as Warburton's told us that it's solely for aesthetics as the crumpets are already cooked. Once toasted, the crumpets then go on to be cooled in three separate rooms, each with varying temperatures. First, starting at 18 degrees Celsius, 15 degrees, and then 10 degrees. After being cooled, a system scans the crumpets, inspecting each one for their color, porosity, and consistency in shape. The crumpets highlighted in this green border signify that they are good and ready for packaging. This row here, without the green border, this means that they're not quite up to the standards for Warburton's, so they're taken off the line. These custom-made robotics are capable of picking up 86 crumpets a minute, sending each one onto the final stage of the process, packaging. So we got a packet of crumpets straight off the line. I'm actually very excited about this because despite having lived in the UK for more than seven years now, I've actually never had a crumpet in my life. I know it's a disgrace, so I'm gonna make up for it and uh, give it a try. Mm. It's nice. I love how it's very crusty in here. Like the bottom has a very, very strong, strong and solid crust, and and the top is like spongy, soft. I would say you almost get two flavors. You get the the savory, the savory crust of the bottom side, and then like a, 
a more a more sweet taste of the of the spongy spongy top side. It's uh, it's very nice. I love how the butter is like completely disappeared into the holes, which means that when you bite into it, you actually get the buttery taste in there. The texture is it's nice and spongy. It's cakey. And yeah, it's just a just a nice discovery for me. I wish I wish I had known <laughs> about crumpets before. Like, where were my British friends when I needed them, guys? I had to know about this seven years ago. From a production perspective, uh, when I look at crumpet plants, we've got three crumpet plants, and on average, we produce thirty-six thousand crumpets an hour, which equates to about six thousand packets of six-pack crumpets. So when you look across a week, that's equivalent to about 800,000 packets coming out of our infield site alone every week. So in order to make 800,000 packets of crumpets a year, we have to have a shift pattern that's robust enough to facilitate that. And, and we run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have four, four shifts that operate 12 hour shifts across the seven days of the week. We only shut as a business on Christmas day. So we are actually producing products 364 days of the year to make sure that our customers always get what they want.